good afternoon ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to the second half of the second day of hlf 2021 uh, we had some very fruitful sessions in the morning and what you are now going to uh, listen to is uh, a path breaking study uh, done by akar patel on our hindu rashtra what it is and how we got here that's the title of his book akar is a known columnist and journalist and an author he writes in english and gujarati and uh, is an extremely popular uh, columnist and his views and his uh, what he has to say is uh, uh, listened to with a lot of attention um, uh, i have heard him several times with great admiration so and i'm 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 a great fan of his so i'm very happy to have uh, akar here with us today and uh, he'll talk to you for about 35 40 minutes after which we'll do a question answer session with him all yours akar thank you very much ajay that was extremely kind uh, i should say uh, before starting off that this book that you referred to has its basis in a talk that i made uh at your uh, festival a couple of years ago very and true very it true. got my mind uh, thinking as to what it is that hindu rashtra the phrase meant uh we are often uh given this phrase both by people within the bjp uh, mr swami or dr swami says we are already in a hindu rashtra it's used by the rss as well but there is no specific definition for it so i felt that it would be interesting to kind of uh, flesh out what those two words meant uh and uh in doing so i put together the book which is this uh, published by uh, uh westland amazon um out last month i i started by uh looking at a a comparison of uh how it is that nations in south asia outside of india looked at their uh, constitutions specifically looked at their uh, minorities because hindu rashtra tends to be exclusive it excludes non hindus from the rashtra which is a nation and if we look at say broader definitions of the same thing such as let's say the two nation theory which says that there are two nations within this geographical space one is hindu and one is muslim does it adhere to the same concept so that is what i wanted to ask myself and uh, look into so the material we have with us shows that outside of india all the other south asian nations are actually constitutionally or in some other way legally uh, majoritarian which means that they uh, privilege one particular community usually on the basis of faith do not always over the others so uh, if you look at afghanistan and pakistan the the head of state there can only be a muslim uh, in pakistan and also in afghanistan and even the prime minister needs to be from that faith in the maldives the same uh, applies uh, it's slightly narrower you, uh, one has to be sunni uh, to be a part of even the uh, majlis which is their uh, parliament lanka uh, privileges uh, buddhism they have a ministry for uh, buddha uh, shasana uh, which looks at the faith uh, from the uh, theravada uh, perspective uh bangladesh i think is closest to where we are in terms of being secular but, and, and in fact the constitution does say that it is a secular nation but the constitution also opens with the words of bismillah rahman rahim so we're not really sure what it is that the reality actually is uh bhutan is possibly the most theocratic nation in the world which will uh, surprise those of us who see it as being this benign sort of place in our neighborhood but it is a state where both religion and uh, all of a temporal power comes and is united under one person which is the king uh, who uh, controls both the faith and the government uh, but we excluded uh, bhutan when we looked at the caa where we said that there is a persecution of uh, minorities where we looked at primarily or only at at the muslim states in our neighborhood Nepal used to be a Hindu rashtra till a few years ago um and it was the only Hindu rashtra in the world why was it called Hindu rashtra why, why did it call itself that uh, it did so 
because it had a constitution uh, where executive power flowed from a kshatriya king, exactly as is prescribed in the Manusmriti. And this king who claimed Aryan descent uh, by the constitution was guided in his court by uh, Brahmins. And so these two things, the guidance of Brahmins and the rule of uh, power by uh, Kshatriya is what defined Nepal as being uh, Hindu Rashtra. There was nothing else uh, taken from the Smriti features which would define Nepal as being a Hindu Rashtra. For example, it didn't say that the Shudra should only confine himself to doing menial work. It didn't say that the entire economy should be handed over to the Vesh. Nor can you do that in the world of 2020 and 2021 because it's not really possible. All nations are signatories to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and you cannot consign people to specific kinds of work uh, based on their birth. So, so beyond that, it was not really possible. Uh, so if and when uh, Nepal does go back to being a uh, Hindu Rashtra from a republic, which it is, uh, is now, it will have to go back to that form, which is that it will need to bring back the king, um, hereditary king, uh, acknowledged as being a Kshatriya. And then he will have some uh, Brahmins in his court who will sort of help him and guide him on the laws. Does India have that limited option? Nepal was a very limited uh, Hindu Rashtra. It didn't have uh, any of the other features that would define uh, what, say, the Manusmiti would look at as being uh, the ideal or the only Hindu Rashtra. We don't even have that limited option. We don't have a hereditary king of Kshatriya descent that the country accepts. Um, uh, so it's not possible for India, even in that limited way, to replicate what it is that Nepal did. Uh, so if that, even if that limited route is closed for us, what is it that we mean when we say Hindu Rashtra? And um, the answer to that is that we've done pretty much what the, uh, the other nations in South Asia have done, which is that they've tried to privilege the uh, majority in some way, and, and we'll look at how. But over years, they figured out that there's not much, there's not much attraction, not much really changes in society when you do that. And so what they've fallen back on is the persecution of their minorities. So any nation that is majoritarian, that uh, privileges its uh, majority, tends over time to fall back on persecution of the minorities as a definition of what it is uh, in terms of a religious or uh, majoritarian nation. I'll um, compare India to Pakistan because I think we are sort of closest to them culturally along with uh, Bangladesh. And I think uh, the experience that that country had uh, on its journey, uh, on its uh, constitutional and legal journey, holds some uh, lessons for us. So Pakistan, as some might know, uh, began as a secular state. In fact, a few days before the 15th of August, uh, when uh, Mr. Jinnah uh, spoke to the Constituent Assembly, he uh, didn't use the word secular so much as defined what he saw the constitution as being uh, in terms of a very uh, pluralist, uh, non-religious uh, state. Um, his very famous words are that Hindus would cease to be Hindus and Muslims would cease to be Muslims from the point of view of the state. So you would have freedom, not only religious, but the state would not recognize you as an individual through the lens of your faith. It would treat you as, it would treat all Pakistanis as being the same. For about a decade, this remained uh, in law. Uh, Pakistan took a long time to form its uh, constitution. They, they are on their third or fourth constitution, depending on how you count. But the first one that they wrote up, it took about a decade um, and it had people from Bangladesh, it had people from uh, West Pakistan, which is, which is uh, a Pakistan today. And they got together and they put together something which was not dissimilar to what India also had, which was based in the 1935 Government of India Act. Um, and it promised sort of uh, fundamental rights fairly closely linked to what was promised also in India at the time. We uh, got our constitution out in 1950. Um, so the usual things that states say that that that's, that 
a state say, which is that people shall be equal. There shall be no discrimination on the basis of faith or gender. Um, uh, you shall have freedom of religion and so on and so forth. Uh, the first indication of things not being quite the same came a, a, roughly a decade later. Uh, Ayub Khan became a president. The, the army took over. He believed he was, uh, and his uh, biographers tend to uh, agree with him to a large extent, of a modernist outlook, that he wasn't uh, antediluvian, he didn't want to fall back on old uh, uh, animosities. In his own uh, autobiography, there is very little of faith. He sort of, it's primarily history and what uh, changes he wanted to bring about. But the law says at this point that the president can only be a Muslim. And this comes out of the uh, preamble uh, that Pakistan gave itself six months after Jinnah died. Uh, this is called the uh, Objectives Resolution. And it says that sovereignty, that Pakistan would be a republic, but sovereignty would be in the hands of Allah. So there, you have a contradiction here. You're saying that you're a republic in the sense that power is with the people, but you're also saying that sovereignty is with Allah. So there's a dual a sovereignty uh, uh, established through the uh, preamble. And that caused a series of problems which didn't go away because whenever people would uh, ask for laws which were more secular, um, the opponents would always point to the fact that you know sovereignty wasn't with them and it had to actually uh, align itself, the laws, in some ways with what it was that uh, Allah said. Um, the Hindus in the Pakistani uh, Constituent Assembly who were primarily uh, Bengalis uh, because Pakistan was still uh, united then, uh, opposed this. Uh, Liaqat Ali Khan, who was Jinnah's uh, successor, said that this was important because Pakistan wanted to make a difference to its majority, that Pakistan was founded as an idealistic state which was different from the model that was adopted by Machiavelli. So if you look at Europe and the modern nation state, you're seeing that ethics and morals generally don't have anything to do with the formation of the state. It is primarily secular business. Uh, Liaquat and many of the other Muslims in the Pakistani Constituent Assembly differed from that. They said that, well, no, uh, Islam is a complete way of life. It brings certain moral lessons for us. And if we are to introduce this into the polity society, through the government, society will become better over time. So this, this was the basis of the uh, granting of sovereignty to Allah and not to the people. Well, the Hindus opposed this, saying, you know, this, this would, be, this would make, make Pakistan the only state which was doing so, which was true. Uh, they also said that there is no unanimity amongst Muslim uh, clergy, what constitutes right and wrong, what constitutes good and bad. Even within the Sunnis, they had uh, four faiths that looked at different aspects of uh, jurisprudence. And there was no real uh, agreement on that, uh, to which Liaquat said that, well, uh, the constitution also says that this uh, sovereignty of Allah will be exercised through the will of those who have been democratically elected. So it's not really the handing over of power to the clergy. It is essentially democracy by, by another name. Fair enough. So in 10 years, what happens is the first aspect of uh, exclusion comes into play, which is the president, because the state is beholden to Allah and our sovereignty rests with him. The president of that state can only be a, a Muslim. Uh, in Bhutto's time, a few years later, another clause was added, which also restricted the office of the prime minister to uh, Muslims only. Uh, but to go back to what it was that Liaquat and his fellow Muslims tried to do, what the, the, most of the laws that tried to make Muslims better Muslims came later. They came in the period of Zia uh, uh, primarily, and they took two, three forms. One is that they said, okay, we are going to make uh, the debits of zakat uh, compulsory. So in Ramzan, if you have a fixed deposit in your bank, um, you're going to get a certain sum debited, two and a half percent, which will go towards uh, zakat. Uh, to this, the Shia 
uh, objected. The, the, the Shia have a more organized, vertically uh, organized clergy than, than the Sunni do. And they said that we paid to our, our, our clergy directly and therefore we should be uh, excluded from this. Uh, and, and they were. And what happened and what happens even today is that a lot of Sunnis in Ramzan in Pakistan tend to declare themselves Shia so that they don't have to pay uh, zakat. They also tried to impose uh, the state on Rosa, which was quite surprising because in South Asia, most Muslims uh, observe Rosa and uh, they do so uh, diligently. They're not required by the state to be forced to do so. But what Pakistan did was it shut its restaurants in uh, Ramzan uh, or it limited the access to the restaurants to those who were non-Muslim. Uh, there was some violence over that because you can't really visually tell who's Muslim and who's not, not a Muslim. Uh, it tried also to uh, do two more things. One is uh, change the penal code. So in Pakistan, uh, everybody knows what Section 144 means, what you know Dafa Teen So Do means, what uh, Char So Beast means, because it's the same penal code, which Macaulay left to the subcontinent. He, he wrote it up in the 1860s, and for the last 150 odd years, the entire subcontinent has been ruled, governed through the same penal code. Under Zia, Pakistan changed this uh, and brought in uh, punishments which were different for different for the for, uh, for the same crime. So blasphemy, which 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 got you three years in uh, India in the old penal code, then became a life sentence and then became a death sentence um, if you abused the uh, the uh, prophet of Islam. Um, you had uh, the uh, stoning of people who uh, were uh, um, adulterers, the word is zina. You had lashing of people who had uh, alcohol. And I can remember about 40 years ago, uh, magazines in India showing people in Pakistan being tied to posts and being lashed. So this, this was uh, done uh, during the Azia period. They also tried to abolish uh, interest which uh, there is a dispute amongst the jurists on whether usury is different from uh, from interest. But because it was felt by, by many people that it's the same thing, said, okay, bans, which would have brought about collapse of, of the banking system and the uh, economy. And so they, they, they had to work out a way of trying to get out of this uh, mess that they had uh, created. What they did was they called... Uh, interest uh, profit sharing. So it's the same thing basically with uh, with a different name. So just to go back, all of these things that they tried to impose didn't work. When you tried to make the majority more pious so that you get blessings, it didn't work. The, the, the zakat thing didn't work. You had Sunnis declaring themselves Shia. The Rosa thing wouldn't have worked in any case because most South Asians follow it. Uh, restaurants that were owned by Muslims protested saying that this is wrong uh, and this is loss of business. The penal code stuff didn't work. Pakistan has laws even today on the book that, that sort of require stoning and uh, amputations and so on. But they're not used because no modern judge wants to pass down a sentence that says that you should cut somebody's hand off for theft. That didn't work. Uh, riba didn't work either, which is which is the, uh, the problem with uh, usury. What remained was the persecution of the minorities. So what had started off as exclusion of non-Muslims from the offices of the head of state and of prime minister became extended. So they, uh, they uh, identified the minority communities uh, like the uh, Ahmadiyya in uh, Punjab, like the Shia in uh, Karachi. And there was uh, a persecution by the state uh, the uh, Ahmadis are uh, uh, persecuted by the state and uh, constitutionally. This is what the Pakistan model was. Uh, India, and okay, we are very different. We are secular. Um, the, the individual will not be recognized for her faith. Uh, constitutionally, things that the majority feels are... Uh, rights that shouldn't be given to the minorities will be given because we are a secular state. 
two examples, Article 25, right to propagation, which says it's a very clear, if you look at the Constituent Assembly debates, it becomes clear that this is a right given specifically to the uh, Christian community, which insisted that as an article of their faith, they would want the right to propagate. Uh, Ambedkar, in his first draft of uh, the, the right, uses the word convert. For, for him, the two words meant the same thing, propagate. And, uh, convert the word that is ultimately used is a propagate, but when it is passed, he does not actually intervene in that vote because he feels that what was uh, specified in the text was uh, good enough for him. What has happened over time is that the Hindu sentiment has overturned the right, both through the state and the political parties. Uh, starting with uh, 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 Odisha uh, and then uh, Madhya Pradesh and through the Supreme Court, uh, we have overturned the a, a fundamental right and put it into the penal code. So to give you an example, in many states of India, I would say most states, you do not have freedom of uh, a religion. So in uh, Gujarat, if you wanted to convert or change your faith, you have to fill out an application and give it to the district magistrate or the uh, collector who will determine whether or not they will let you change your faith. Uh, and they can say no. And there was a report in the Express a couple of years ago which said that half of the people who had applied had been denied. And most of the people who had been approved were those who were, who were uh, Hindus uh, converting to uh, Buddhism. Um, so the state determines whether or not you can change your faith. The state requires you to fill out a form which, uh, where you have to submit uh, your uh, salary, your caste, your reasons for uh, converting, the list of guests and the addresses of those who are coming to the ceremony. The person who is converting you also needs to fill out a form and ask for uh, permission. So basically, there, there is no freedom uh, as such. And um, these laws are replicated throughout uh, the country. We've heard of the Love Jihad laws in UP and in uh, Madhya Pradesh. These are actually uh, conversion laws. Um, and there's another unique feature to them, which is the reversal of burden of proof. So if, if I murder somebody or if somebody is raped, the person who's accused uh, doesn't have to prove the uh, the uh, fact that they didn't do it. It is up to the state to put together a case and prove their guilt. In several of these laws that Hindus felt uh, offended by, it is the individual who has to demonstrate to the satisfaction of the state that he or she has not uh, committed the crime. This is also true for a uh, cow slaughter, as 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 we shall see. But if a woman converts uh, to, say, Islam in UP or in uh, Madhya Pradesh now, even if she files an affidavit saying that she did so uh, of her own volition, under pressure, because she chose this faith, it is still up to the male members and the other members of the family she's marrying into to prove the fact that they didn't put any kind of uh, pressure on her. And some of it becomes slightly more difficult. I, I said that uh, this, uh, this this law also applies, this, this rule also applies to cow slaughter. So Gujarat has reversed the burden of proof on a cow slaughter, uh, where if, um, if I'm uh, accused of having done something, I have to prove to the satisfaction of the state and the court that I didn't do it. Now this produces problems. There was a case uh, from 2019 where a man was accused of slaughtering a calf and serving it in the biryani served at his daughter's wedding. Case was filed. Man was jailed. Uh, man said it wasn't biryani, it was mutton. The forensic sciences laboratory said that they could not determine what the meat was. The judge said that in the, in the uh, event that the state cannot prove that it is not beef, it is up to the individual to show that the meat consumed many months ago was uh, um, actually mutton, and it sentenced him. The sentence for cow slaughter in Gujarat is life. Uh, no other white collar crime actually attracts life. Uh, and why do I call it a white collar crime? Cow slaughter, as you might know, is not a crime because of the religion. The Muslims in the Constituent Assembly said very openly, if you want to ban it for religious reasons, say so. We, that uh, uh, 
that that slaughtering a cow is not an obligation in uh, Islam. Uh, they have the freedom to do that in India, but the state was welcome to close their freedom. The Hindu said, no, no, we don't want to force you to do something. This is just something that we need to do because of animal husbandry, that we need more milk, we need better breeds of cows and so on. So the criminal punishment for cow slaughter in our country is not because of uh, religious reasons. It is because the state believes that the more cows you have, the more bulls you have in an era where you have tractors, where most cows are actually uh, inseminated, not by bulls, but through uh, uh, in vitro. Um, it makes no sense to have a very large number of male uh, cows. But uh, in India, the reason that is used is, well, uh, it's uh, animal husbandry. And for that, you have to pay uh, with a life sentence. So it makes no sense. Uh, but that's, that's the way it is. India has done its majoritarianism as the laws on religion and on cows uh, show more devious. Pakistan has become majoritarian more uh, in a more uh, honest way, uh, in a more uh, direct way. We have done it in a more devious way. Pakistan doesn't have a single Hindu chief minister in its four states. India doesn't have a single Muslim chief minister in its 28 states. Uh, we've not had a Muslim chief minister outside of Kashmir, and now we never will in Kashmir either, because it's not a state anymore for a very long time. The longest serving Muslim chief minister outside of Kashmir in India, Anbule, served two years. The ruling party of this country, which has a majority in the Lok Sabha, 303 MPs, none of them is a Muslim. Uh, the last 282 seat majority it had, none of them is a Muslim. Out of the 28 states in India, uh, 15 states do not have a Muslim uh, minister. Of the 10 states that have a Muslim minister, it is one minister, usually given the minority of his portfolio. So if the idea of majoritarianism is exclusion, it is equally applicable and true in India as it is in Pakistan. In Pakistan, it is by law. In India, it has come in more devious fashion that it might not have been written in law. But the net effect is the same, that you have excluded a large section of your people from power. You have made sure that the rights that they were given as fundamental rights were taken away from them through, I think, fairly dishonest means. Uh, but the uh, pretense has remained from the start that this is a state that is secular. This is a state that is different from the rest of South Asia. And while the words to that might be true in terms of the constitution, at least in part, if you read the constitution, my uh, advice to those who haven't read it yet, yet is to read it upside down. So basically, the footnotes to the constitution are more important than the rights themselves. For example, uh, the, the, the right to occupation is a fundamental right uh, in India, uh, Article 90. But it, it is not actually, because the courts have said that the rights of Hindus to protect cows is more important than the right of a butcher to slaughter a cow, even one that is not uh, productive. Supreme Court judges have said that cows can never be slaughtered because they are uh, productive throughout their life. They are a dung-making factory. That is that is what the Supreme Court has said. And for that reason, uh, the butcher should not be allowed to, to uh, touch them. So this is the way, this is the different way in which we have become a majoritarian. This is the Hindu Rashtra that we have, which on the carapace, on, on the surface, says that it is secular and it is plural. But within, it is not really different from any of the other states in uh, South Asia. Uh, and now that we have entered into a fairly decisive phase where you've got a party that doesn't hide the fact that it is majoritarian and wants to push that specific agenda further, we will discover more and more in time, as we are seeing every day, that there will be legislation, there will be policy, there will be society acting uh, against the minorities in some way. Um, and I think that uh, in time, uh, by the time that this, this phase is done, and I think we still have a few more years to go for it, things will get worse. So broadly speaking, that is the thesis of, of my book. Um, I'm happy to take uh, questions and to uh, chat with you further. Thank you so much, Akar. This was a fine exposition of uh, of the historical background of Hindurashtra and its 
perfect comparison with how Pakistan has evolved from uh, what Jinnah gave birth to uh, to today. Uh, my one question which I was going to ask you and which you have answered uh, in a way is, uh, is amendment to the constitution required at all to achieve Hindu Rashtra? No, you, you don't need it. There is no, basically what is it that we can look at as being the ideal uh, Hindu Rashtra? Uh, you've got the Nepal model. What defines Hindu Rashtra? I would say that it is not possible in 2021 for us to go back to our own scripture to say, okay, uh, Patels are Patidas from the Shudra community, which by uh, Smriti are not actually allowed to read and, and to write. Can we have that in the world of 2021? We can't. Also because my community, the Shudras, are the largest part of the population of this country. They're not going to be uh, forced to let go of what it is that they're doing and be subservient to a much smaller group. That 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 is not going to happen. The only thing that can happen, actually, is the increased persecution of uh, minorities. So, within there is no program uh, within the BJP, and there never has been for the last 60 years, which looks at the majority. So, for instance, they have never sought to deepen uh, reservations for the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes. They could have done so by saying, okay, we are going to extend what the Congress has done into the uh, private sector. They, they don't say that. Um, they, they have no specific program of work that is even definable and consistent over the last 60 years. It might surprise viewers to know that uh, under Mr. Vajpayee, the BJP was very socialist, that it said that the maximum amount that a person could earn in a month was rupees 2000 and whatever came to him or her above that would be taken by the state. They defined also the size of the houses you would live in. So economically, they've never had this sort of consistency in terms of a policy. When we talk about Hindutva ideology, it tends to be negatively framed that Muslims should not keep their temple, Muslims should not keep their personal law, Muslims should not keep their uh, autonomy in Kashmir. So, um, can you explain to us what is the ideology of Hindutva? What is it that they wish to achieve other than, you know, othering the Muslims? Other than... Or is that, nothing that, is that the end in that, itself? Yeah, that's it. It, it. it is limited to making sure that uh, Muslims specifically, to some extent also uh, Christians, face active persecution through the law, as you're seeing with cow slaughter, with love jihad. Uh, it might interest people to know that. And there's been data, you know, that's been uh, published on this, that the beef lynching is a category of violence introduced to this country after 2014. So the prime minister made speeches on the pink revolution. He pushed two states to draft their laws. Uh, Maharashtra, uh, Haryana then uh, 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 responded and wrote their laws. The violence started immediately afterwards. So 97% of all cow-related uh, violence in India, and specifically what we call the beef lynching, which is a stopping of somebody on the road by a vigilante mob and then murdering them, is entirely the gift of uh, the uh, present government. So th this is what is sought to be achieved. The Love Jihad law in one part uh, uh, discourages and harasses couples, but it also uh, encourages large parts of society to go and seek out and harass and abuse couples actively on the street. So it, it serves a dual purpose. So beyond that, if you look at, say, uh, foreign policy, there is no consistency in the manifestos that either the Janasang or the BJP had actually put out. There's no reference to China at all in the 2019 manifesto of uh, Mr. Modi. And what would be seen, seen as hard nationalism, you know, that we will not surrender our land, we will, we will die for it, doesn't seem to apply to this party. They would rather say, oh, there is no intrusion and move on from uh, Chinese aggression rather than actually uh, concede it. This doesn't seem to be particularly an uh, ideological or nationalistic uh, stance. What is consistent is how they view the minorities, specifically the Muslims and what it is that they do to them. It's very interesting because um, uh, just in a session before lunch, we had Harsh Mandar with us. And Harsh was narrating his own experience from his own family and social group and 
all our observations that hatred has become quite normal acceptable in society today than it ever was uh, yeah. and uh, that is largely promoted by uh, by politics so there, there is a nice uh, parallel that we can look at here as well with uh, pakistan so in undivided india and in pakistan up to the 80s there are less than 10 blasphemy cases that are registered because this is not something we are naturally speaking the people of the subcontinent tend to be respectful towards the other faith we don't tend to have a blasphemous attitude generally speaking so only less than 10 cases from a uh, pre 1947 from the 20s onwards till the 80s in the 80s pakistan introduces first the life sentence and then the death penalty what happens instantly is that minorities tend to be targeted with it the neighbor uh, accuses the uh, ahmadi or the uh, christian or the hindu of having said something in offense of the prophet or the book and then that person is either lynched or they're jailed uh, and judges find it very hard to bail them out because the mob is extremely violent so this is top down state imposed uh discrimination and uh, brutalization which we are seeing in our parts of the world as well that society tends to remain dormant but once the state activates something through a law and elevates it to the point where it is seen as being an offense whether it's cow slaughter or whether it's love jihad or it finds society backing society tends to respond state backing yes it's it, it, it is, yeah it, the, the state acts as a catalyst and then you have violence that sort of increases yeah and is that the reason why you see um, a majority of hindus uh, seem to be approve approving this or do you think we that we don't have any that polls on wrong? people because that's a question I, that I is asked that on, uh, by the audience what percentage of people uh, what percentage of people actually support uh, this is the question okay so my answer to that would not be definitive but i would look at the facts okay so the facts are what we are today in the 37th month of gdp decline we started decline in gdp growth in january 2018 uh, sequentially uh, 12th quarter this is the 13th quarter we we will be negative uh, unemployment uh, became record high just before 2019 polls according to government data that uh, we were at we were at 6.5% then now it's about 9 uh a survey from the government uh, by by the nso in 2018 showed that indians were consuming and earning and spending less in 2017 2018 than they were in 2012 2013 they were they were spending about 2.5% less uh after 6 years so they were poorer clearly it cannot be on the basis of a performance that we can say that mr modi is a popular and i would uh, concede that he is extremely popular so if not that what is it that he is popular for well uh, we have to assume that people who uh, who uh, approve of him either do not know of what has happened in the rest of society in the last 7 years that he's been in charge or they know and they are fine with it i would rather uh, assume the latter it is not wise in my opinion to assume that people don't know what is what is uh, going on so they do know what is uh, going on in kashmir what is going on on the issues of cow on rab jihad on china but they feel it's fine so the conclusion that one can draw logically speaking seems to be that even if it's not a majority a very large number of us seem to be okay with this so i i asked this question to harsh also and i'll repeat that with you it's not merely the issue of hatred that's uh, uh, that's bothersome uh, demonetization was the largest criminal act that was ever done on human kind by anyone right that seems to be fine with the people uh, they go back and uh, and support uh, uh, the government the terrible inept handling of the covid pandemic was even worse than that that also does not deter people i mean wake up people to understand what's right and what's wrong why is this so what what's going on 
I, we can only speculate. I think social science doesn't want to get into these things because they tend to look at things which are a collective psychology and, and so on. But I think what you're saying is true, that acts of commission, which are harmful, and it would be very difficult to argue that they are not harmful. For instance, how many women were exploited in the days and hours after demonization where they didn't understand what the rules were, didn't have the information to be able to know what it is that the thousand rupee notes in their hands meant. We will never know. Um, and I think the trauma that we have put our citizens, our uh, fellow human beings through in that lockdown phase, uh, I, I, I think that that is something which approaches a criminality. Um, but it appears that these acts of a commission, which were deliberate, do not seem to have dented, and perhaps it could be argued, have reinforced the popularity of the of the uh, strong man. Mm. I can speculate and say that it boils down to something that a large number of people would say, well, he's doing something about it. It might not be working, but at least he's not doing nothing about it. Uh, whether that is true or not, I cannot say. But this is, I think, something which requires study and it requires urgent study. I think that a nation damaging and eating itself from the inside needs to have some form of a corrective action. What you have described tells us that we do not seem to have that a correction uh, mechanism built in. When the US blunders in Vietnam, internally it tends to resist it and forces it back to the right path or on slavery or on Jim Crow. We tend, we, we don't seem to have, like the, like the rest of South Asia, we don't seem to have that internal uh, corrective mechanism which looks at a fault and says that we need to change our route. Uh, Archana is asking a question on you, uh, on uh, from the audience. Uh, will Hindurashtra eventually mean conversion of minorities to Hinduism? Well, there are two problems with that. One is that you cannot convert into Hinduism because you need to come into a caste. So mm -hmm. the speculation that Swami Vivekananda has in terms of how it is that the early Hindus were actually converted. He says that the sages would go out and they would look at these uh, tribals and those of them that they found to be fit and warrior-like, they would make uh, a kshatriya and so on. You can't do that in the world of 2021. Nobody should be telling somebody else what their faith should be or shouldn't be. The reason why ghar vapsi uh, tends to be called that is that uh, you, you stay in the same caste uh, as you were converted out of, or your forefathers were actually converted out of, which is why we have such uh, rare cases of voluntary uh, garvapsi, because most people who are converted out tend to come from either Shudra or what is called a Malay uh, background, which is they would be from the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes. Nobody wants to go back to that. So that is one of, one of the problems. The other problem is that of uh, coercion, uh, the world of 2021, of which we are a part economically, in terms of media, socially, we have millions of uh, Indians living in the US and the UK and the rest of the world, will not let us do what it is that we, we want to do uh, if they feel that we are going down the wrong path. I'll uh, give you an uh, example of that. The Shaheen Bagh protests began after the CAA law was passed. Um, the, but the CA law's rules have still not been framed. The law is not applicable today. The law says that those who came into India before the end of uh, December 2014, and they were from a non-Muslim community from these uh, three nations, they would be granted citizenship automatically. That's still not happened. Why has it not happened? It's not happened because the rest of the world said what you're doing is wrong. There is a very strong motion against India in the EU a parliament that was tabled but not voted on. And we tried very hard to get it not to be voted on because we don't want to be seen by the rest of the world as being a sort of discriminatory society. We might do so at the level of uh, 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 of real lived um, experience, but we don't want to be seen as uh, doing that by law. So I think that for these two reasons, I don't see that happening. Okay, before I close, where do you see uh, India heading on this path uh, let's say by 2024 and beyond. 
I think that socially speaking, we are pretty much in the middle of how bad it's going to be. I don't think it's going to get much worse than this. You can be accused of wanting to say a joke that you haven't said, but I think you're going to say a joke and therefore you should be in jail for 40 days and God knows how many more days that man is going to spend in jail. Uh, I'm referring to Munawar Farooq. Farooq. Uh, yes, but, but I think that the larger problem will be on the non-social front. I think that uh, when you have a messianic person, very popular, uh, running a state with very little internal resistance and a great sense of certitude of what to do and what not to do, the damage happens not only at the level of society, but elsewhere as well. I fear that economically, what we have done to ourselves will actually continue. Uh, people will know now that by the end of uh, a financial year 2021, GDP per capita in dollar terms will be behind the, uh, Bangladesh. Uh, and one reason for that is that we have slipped to a very large extent. Uh, malnutrition is rising. Actually, in the last year, it rose. Uh, uh, stunting is not going away. Um, Indians are poorer. Many Indians are poorer now than they were in 2012, 2013, according to government data. The government showed that well, the uh, uh, economist showed uh, last month that uh, Mr. Uh, Mukesh Ambani was 350% wealthier uh, in the period of 2020. Mr. Gautam Adani was 700%, more than 700% wealthier in the period of 2020. But a lot of us have become poorer. I think that the, the accrual of wealth at a very small tip of the pyramid in India with a very broad base of large numbers of masses of really poor people will actually continue. I don't think we have the ideas, the broad strategies to be able to come out of a lower middle income country and actually become developed. Last, absolutely last question. How can this slide be stopped? Any thoughts? I think we have some space, constitutionally speaking, within the freedoms that have been given to us as fundamental rights to be able to resist it. If you look at what stopped the government over the last 13 months from implementing the CA and the NRC, which we were promised would come, was not the courts, which haven't heard the constitutionality of either the CA or the NRC or the NPR or the opposition. It has come from a protest. It has come from very brave women who led a nationwide movement. If you look at what stopped the farm uh, laws from being uh, put into place, it wasn't uh, the opposition, which demanded a uh, division vote in the Rajya Sabha, but didn't get it. It wasn't the courts, which have tended to uh, sort of broker a kind of a peace rather than try and look at the constitutionality. It's been the physical protest of, of the farmers, which has pushed the government back into saying that, okay, we're going to hold the laws for... Uh, for 18 months. So while we have limited space in terms of pushing back, of the three things that are legitimate ways to engage the state within any democracy, vote, litigation, and protest, I think the third one, standing up for our rights physically, standing up for the rights of the others who we feel have been slighted and have been wronged is the most important bit, I think. Akar, thank you very, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, after this one hour, you know why Akar has such a large following everywhere. People want to listen to him. It was amazing to have you here, uh, Akar. This was a wonderful one hour that we spent with you. Punamu and Nala, Colu Pussy Cassin, the Colu Punamu and Nala, Colu Pussy Cassin, the Colu Nidu Nimalakin, the Gunner Lakin, the Wangi Pule, Ranga Kongan, the Tune, Wangi Pule.